Uh, we're going to have the battle royale today. Just think of, just think of, uh, in one corner, you got evolution, which is spends trillions of dollars. You know, just think of the, all the decades of promoting evolution in the Big Bang. You got the godless tag team of the Big Bang and evolution, and they influence. They're running basically our governments, the school system, education. I mean, the foundation for our education and our school system and our media is evolution. It's godless. And that's in one quarter, and it's influenced people like uh, Darwin and Dawkins and Haeckel, even Hitler. You know, he believed in evolution really strongly to get the master race. And that's in one corner, and then, you know, a formidable Goliath, just insurmountable. And then in the other corner, you've got the holy tag team of the Bible and creation. And God's word has influenced the people of science, like, uh, like Newton and Galileo and Haeckel, not Haeckel, um, Faraday. Uh, Kepler, you know, the who's who of science, they were all creationists. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a 15-round bout, and you guys are going to be the judges. So you're going to score the boats, see one point per boat, and you're going to score it. And we're going to start with the uh, universe. Who can explain it the best? The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The evolutionists say, no, there's a picture in NASA. Look at that, Big Bang. You know, a Big Bang, and there's a textbook says that uh, all, the, all the matter exploded from a single point. And that's where our tax money's going. And the creations, they counter, well, what about Spike Bezeros? He went into the military space program as, a, as an evolutionist and an atheist, and he came out as a Christian and a creationist. And I had an opportunity to meet with, the, with some of the leaders and have a meal with them, and I asked him, Spike, what happened? And he said, well, there was a Christian in there, a creationist, and I thought he was an idiot. I mean, doesn't he know that we can explain everything without God? And I started to, you know, poke at his foundation, and it was solid. And then he started to poke at mine, and it crumbled. And I said, did he ask you anything that just made you stop and think? And uh, he said, yeah. He said, how can you believe in the Big Bang and the laws of physics at the same time? Nailed them. Because the Big Bang has matter coming from nowhere, violating the first law of thermodynamics. And then that matter becomes more and more complex, producing everything we see, violating the second law. And I do a series there, on Evolution versus Science, I gave a talk at St. Cloud State and just destroy Big Bang and evolution with the laws of physics. And so the evolutionists, they'll say, oh, he's just a crackpot, you know, just a crackpot. He's not a real scientist. And that brings me to Brian Young. He was doing a debate at a state college, and a professor comes up to him and says, you shouldn't even be here. You're taking your faith and your religion, and you're passing it off as science, and you're confusing the kids. And he says, sir, let me ask you a question. And he said, can I ask you a question? The guy says, sure. He says, where did this subatomic particle that supposedly had all the matter in the whole universe, and it supposedly blew up 13.8 billion years ago, you call it a singularity, where did that come from, sir? And the guy goes, we don't know yet. Science has no explanation. Ah, science has no explanation for where that matter came from. So what you're telling me, sir, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you believe in it by faith. And the professor didn't like hearing that. The scientists don't like hearing it. Yeah, but it is a, it is a faith-based faith -based position. So that basically an evolutionist, they have faith in the unknown. Unknown chemicals came together at unknown way, at an unknown place, at an unknown time, and using an unknown process to produce people. <laughs> right? Right? And uh, sometimes at St. Cloud State, I go do a lot of you know, uh, reaching out, standing out tracks, sharing the gospel, a lot of them. One thing that I didn't expect was Jesus attracts. I figured it would repel, but Jesus attracts. And that's, I don't know if you found that when you're door knocking, but when you meet a Christian, it's just so refreshing. And I was out there sharing the gospel one time and handing out tracks, and a, and a professor just comes walking by and says, be crazy somewhere else. And he just keeps walking, you know. He, he says he's walking by, be crazy somewhere else. And I said, crazy? You know what's crazy? It's thinking you're a mutated animal that came from pond scum, that came from exploding stars, that came from nowhere. And he has a loud voice, you know. <laughs> and students are walking by, and the guy kind of looks around at me. But that's crazy. You know, it's a belief system. Another time a professor said, I, I don't believe in uh, prehistoric fables. I said, oh, yeah, but you believe hydrogen and helium turn into people, don't you? And that's a fairy tale for grown-ups. Okay, so when they attack our foundation, we can, we can prod theirs a bit. And you don't have to know all the information. If you get anything out of this seminar, just two questions. How did life begin? Where did matter come from? That's all you need to know. You can ask any atheist, any evolutionist, and they have no idea. No idea. 
And I like this one. If our, if our universe were billions of years old, we would, set countless, we would see countless uh, millions of supernova remnants of all the stars that had died over the year, eons. And we don't. We're not billions of years old. We're not. You know, in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. Okay, that's round one. Okay, round two, stars. Stars. How did they form? This is a textbook. You know, look, let's like, take a look at what it says. A star forms inside a cloud of gas and dust called a nebula. That's a declarative statement, right? It's not could of or might of. A star forms. That's how it forms. It's a declarative statement, right? That is a lie. That is a lie. Because look at what they say in the science journals. The silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is that we do not know how even a single one of these stars might have formed. There's no lack of evident ideas, of course. We just can't substantiate them. So there's a problem with that theory. The formation of stars is one of the most fundamental problems in astrophysics. But Dr. Gary Parker, when he was in grad school, they're talking about the nebula theory. This dust cloud collapses and forms a star. And he asked the professor, how in the world does it does a nebula, how does it collapse when gas pressure is 60 to 100,000 times more powerful than gravity, stronger than gravity? And the professor looks at him and says, uh, well, maybe we should call it the nebulous theory. It doesn't work. And then it goes on to say, no current model can reproduce all the observations. It should say no, atheist, no current atheistic model can do it. But there is a model that can do it. He made the stars also. I love that verse. Hundreds of billions of galaxies full of hundreds of billions of stars, and it's not even a whole verse. And God says, yeah, I did that. And he moves on. The heavens declare the glory of God. Okay, round two. This is round three, comets. You know, they're spinning around, whipping around. We talked a little bit about that. And they're losing material. They can't last more than 10,000 years, or 50,000 years, or even 100,000 years, we'll give them. Why do we still see comets? We'll go into NASA's website. It's because we have an Oort cloud. And that's just an artist's rendition. There's no evidence. We've never seen it. The only reason they made up this Oort cloud is a rescuing device so they can keep living in billions of years. There's no evidence for it at all. Okay, round three, the, or round four, the sun. Okay, the sun has 99% of our mass in the solar system. And it's only got 2% of the angular momentum, 2% of the spin. And that goes way against their theory. It's in the textbooks, how the solar system formed, this swirling dust, swirling dust cloud, and then all the planets spun off according to that. This textbook says most of the planets rotate in this axis. You know, most of them are spinning the same way. Most is a key word. It should be all according to the law of angular momentum. If something is spinning apart, it should all spin the same direction, and it doesn't. You know, Venus spins backwards. Uranus spins on its side, and they can't explain it. They'll have a rescuing device. Oh, there was a collision. Well, how do you know? <laughs> you know, and Spike Bezeris, he does what you're not being told about astronomy yet he has a whole tvd on the solar system every planet violates the big bang theory in one way or another a lot of the moons do too and he does another one on stars and galaxies and another one on the big bang it is just they're grasping at straws i mean he's really good at what he does okay and how did these planets form they, they say that's here's the theory okay you got you got the gas turns to dust, turns to pebbles, turns to rocks, turns to boulders, turns to these planetesimals, which are like hundreds of kilometers across that make up the planets. And it says tiny, and this is what it says. Is this declarative? Tiny bits of dust, frozen gases, and disks stick together into clumps. The clump stuck together and become larger clumps. Clump to the clump to the clump. But that's not what happens. And this is, this is a college textbook. Uh, that was one of the worst investments I ever made. <laughs> It was 115 bucks. I got one for like 110 and the other one was like 80. And I thought, well, I'll just use it, go through it and sell it back. I went back to sell it back and it's like, I'll give you, they won't take one. It's like, that one's out of date. And then the other one was, we'll give you 10 bucks for it. <laughs> what a racket. But anyhow, the aggregation of nebular debris in a planet is a very violent process. Bodies ranging the size of dust to small particles collect to create other, you know, create larger bodies, but that's not what happens. We saw that in Sunday school, they slam into each other. They slam into each other. The, the, the rings of Saturn is, are not turning into a moon. The asteroid belt is not turning into uh, planets. And this is what it says in science, how the process continues from meter-sized boulders to kilometer-sized uh, planetesimals is a major unsolved problem. And this was objects must have grown, that's pretty fuzzy, must have grown rapidly from sub-meter-sized pebbles into 100-kilometer-sized bodies, possibly in a single leap. That's what they have to have happen, because they break apart. The moon, okay, how did it get there? 
They got four theories on how it got there, which just shows that none of them work. The scientist, he jokes that the explanation for the moon is observational error. It doesn't exist because none of their theories can, can predict it. The moon has been going farther away. I don't know if you noticed this yet. It's an inch and a half farther every year. They've got a, you didn't notice, but it has, an inch and a half. <laughs> They've got a reflector plate. That's experiment still going on. And I don't know how they can get so precise, but an inch and a half every year. You know, 6,000 years, that's not a big deal. A few billion years, that's a huge deal. Because as it gets closer to the Earth, the gravitational pull gets stronger and stronger. And so Jason Lyle crunched the numbers and he said in 1.5 billion years, it would have been touching the Earth. So that's a huge problem for evolutionists. The Earth, you know how that form? They say it was a molten blob. Okay, is that right? And the Bible says it was underwater. They moved on the face of the deep, by the face of the waters. Well, let's just take a look at granite. Okay, the bedrock for the ocean is basalt. The bedrock for the continents is granite. And granite has never been molted. It's got these flakes in it of quartz, feldspar, mica, and hornsblende, and they all have different specific gravities. If that was molten at one time, they would have settled out into their specific gravities. They cannot make granite. You know, there was a book by Gentry, Dr. Gentry, Creation's Tiny Mysteries, basically showing that there's some something that put polonium halo or something, the half-life of that, it's still in granite, so it cooled quickly. It was made and it cooled quickly, just like that. And uh, he said, you can prove me wrong by making granite, and nobody can do it. And then the other thing, this was what some people think is the strongest evidence for a young Earth. It's the magnetic field. The half-life for the magnetic field is 1,400 years. So 1,400 years from now will be half as strong. 1,400 years ago, it was twice as strong. 2,800 years ago, it was four times as strong. And uh, so it goes. And uh, whatever, it would have been eight times as strong. And you can only do that so long before it turns into a neutron star, I've heard. I've heard it, it'll rip the iron out of your blood. And so there's no way that we can have an Earth more than, let's say, 20,000 years, based on this observational science. And uh, Russell Humphreys, he's a creation scientist. He, a brilliant man. I think he worked at Los Alamos in one of their labs. And he predicted that, accurately predicted the magnetic field of Uranus and Neptune before we got out there. Evolutionists said, they're too old, they won't have magnetic field. He goes, wait a minute, no, they're just 6,000 years old. And he predicted it, and he was very, very, very close. He also made accurate predictions about Mercury, that it would have a declining magnetic field. And they said, no, it should have stabilized since all these millions of years, but no, it's declining, it's decreasing. So there's a lot of things that point to uh, the creationists. Uh, this one's the next round, rock layers. Are they millions of years? Well, let's just take a look at this geologic column. They made those names and those layers in 1879, the same year the light bulb was invented. So this Bible, the New Testament Bible for the evolutionist, the Old Testament is the Big Bang, the New Testament is the geologic column. They aren't going to change those dates. That was way before radiometric dating. And what they do is they date the rocks with the, with the fossils, and then they date the fossils with the rocks. How old are the dinosaurs? 65 million years. How do you know that? Because it's in that rock layer. Everybody knows that rock layer is 65 million years old. Well, how do you know that? Well, it's got dinosaur bones in it. <laughs> that's how they do it. They have index fossils. And that's how, they, that's how they date them. It's not carbon dating. It's not radiometric dating. You don't radiometric date sedimentary rock. And I got a question. Why are seven of the 12 layers of the Grand Canyon missing? Anybody been to Grand Canyon? Anybody? Did they tell you this? They're, they're missing seven of the 10, or seven of the 12. And the, and the ones on top, that's, you know, maybe they eroded away. But how about the ones in, down at the bottom? Where'd those go? Did it, what happened at that time? See, and the, understand the geologic column doesn't exist anywhere. You can't, like in St. Cloud, there's a whole bunch of granite there. There's no geologic column under my feet, okay? It, it's a mental construct that they put together. And what they don't tell you, is there's polystrate fossils. These are fossils connecting different layers. This, uh, this is a, a tree that's petrified on, in the middle and it's coalified on top and on the bottom. And those two, two coal seams are supposed to be tens of thousands of years apart. I don't know, do you guys got trees down here that stand up for tens of thousands of years once they die? You know? No, it doesn't make sense. They were laid down and we'll get to that. Here's the folded mountains again. They had to be soft layers when they were bent. And you look at the rock layers around the country. 
And this one's really weird. <laughs> How in the world did that form? And that's over by uh, Grand Canyon. And uh, another, another round, if you're scoring at home. Uh, the big, we got big rivers and little canyons. And you go into the Grand Canyon National Park website, and this is what it says. You know, beginning just five to six million years ago, the Colorado River began to carve its way downward. Okay. And that's a declarative statement. And then you go down, to, but they're not telling you is that river did not cut that canyon. That river flows into the canyon a mile below the top of the canyon, and it flows out. How did it flow uphill? And then you go down, I was pretty surprised when I saw this. This is in their website. This, they've got four theories of how it formed. Therefore, none of them work, okay? The Kaibab Plateau, a high point through which the river gingerly slices, poses a problem for geologists. Water certainly doesn't flow uphill. So geologists hypothesize that at the time the river started cutting through it, the kayak bab flow must not have been an obstacle. All these rescuing devices, a whole bunch, and none of them, none of them work. And so what do we have? We got a big canyon here. Anybody heard of Mount St. Helens that blew up? There's Engineers Canyon on the right. That canyon was cut over a year and a half because they thought that if that lake breaches, because the lake didn't have any way out, it's going to make a big flood. Uh, kind of, it would be similar to what happened in the Grand Canyon, by the way. And then the one on the left, they call it the mini Grand Canyon of the, of the Tootle River. See, the mountain blows up, the mud flows down, blocks Spirit Lake. That's the dark part up there. There's no way for it to get out. And there's this canyon, 1,000 feet across, 140 feet deep. That little river didn't cut that canyon. That canyon formed in a mud flow in nine hours. The canyon makes the river. The river doesn't make the canyon. And I do a talk, Grand Canyon Answers, which explains how the Grand Canyon was formed. And it answers all those unanswerable questions. And this is a bonus round. Does anybody know what that is? Anybody want to take a guess? What is it? Tree yeah, what kind of tree stump? Birch. <laughs> Birch, he said. <laughs> it's a petrified tree stump. That's a stone. And uh, petrified tree, yeah, you don't get to see a whole lot of them. So I'll spend some time on this one. You can see them in a textbook. It says they're 225 million years old. You can see them at a museum, or you can go out to North Dakota at Teddy Roosevelt National Park. And you can, this is the skyline of it, by the way, skyline of it. And there's no fence between us and that bison. And I stayed at the Hotel Marriott. That's the room with the view <laughs> and the complimentary uh, breakfast. And then we took a couple of mile walk, hike, and went through this gate where the bison are supposed to be. And that's where the petrified trees are. I don't know if you can see them on that layer all across there. How did they get there? None of them grew there. They don't have roots. And why is it so layered? Okay. And yeah, that's another one that just another picture. There's our sons. So they're huge. My guess, and I'm not sure about this, maybe those were the trees before the flood. Could that they've been floating around with the flood and then sink in the mud and get petrified? And yeah, it's just, a, it was a great time. Great time. Um, and then we went to Yellowstone. Yellowstone has a petrified tree. They have it fenced up so it doesn't run away. And they've got Specimen Ridge, which is a long hike. I never got out there. But there's 20 some layers of petrified trees. And that used to be the best evidence to prove the Bible wrong. Because you had to have a forest grow and die and grow and die and grow and die and grow and die. And that's going to take, you know, tens of thousands of years. So the Bible isn't right. Well, we can learn from Mount St. Helens again. See, when that erupted, that lake went up <laughs> the side of a mountain and came back down and carried with it a whole bunch of logs. And they didn't even know the lake was there when they flew over it because it was all covered with logs. The logs are banging against each other. The bark's going down. So there's layers of bark on the bottom that could turn into coal if it gets heat, heat and pressure. And then they start to get waterlogged and they start to sink vertically. And Steve Austin went there, soup, really cold, really dark, he said, but he estimated there was 20,000 trees at the bottom of that lake and none of them grew there. And they're all at different layers. He said some you could just pull low, push over, they just dropped. Other ones you couldn't dig to the bottom of it. You know, three feet down, they were in there solid. So all these trees are dropping at different rates and then if that lake dries up, you're going to see these. And if they turn, start turned to stone, you're going to see what you saw at Yellowstone. And they can make petrified wood uh, by in, uh, injecting silica into it. And I'll have that out tonight. It's in my bag in the back. But you can pick it up. It's, you can see the rings in the wood, but it's really heavy. 
Okay, next round. Fossils. Okay. Fossils are supposedly the proof of evolution. Well, let's hear what Darwin has to say about fossils. You know, he said, if my theory be true, innumerable transitional forms must have existed. Why do we not find them embedded in the countless numbers and the earth of the crust? So he said, you know, there should be a bunch of transitional fossils, but we don't have them. That just means we haven't found enough fossils. And we got millions, if not billions of fossils. We got plenty of fossils and there's no transitional fossils. They're either animals that are extinct or animals, animals that are alive today. The only difference is a lot of time they're bigger in the fossil record. And then the other difference is what scientists call them. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And this bothered Stephen Gould so much that he came up with a whole new theory. Instead of becoming a creationist, he came up, he started punctuated equilibrium. He said the extreme rarity of forms in the fossil record persists as a trade secret of paleontology. There's no transitional anything, all right? Talking to an evolutionist, I'll ask him, well, what denomination are you? Are you a gradualist like Darwin, or are you a punctuated equilibrianist like Gould? And there's even hopeful monsterists out there that used to believe that uh, the first bird came from the first reptile, came from a reptile egg, all, all the changes at once. So they've got all these denominations, and it's just, they're just grasping at straws. And this, uh, this guy, uh, it's Colin Patterson, he wrote a fossil book. And he had more fossils than at his disposal at that British Museum of Natural History than anybody in the world. And somebody wrote to him and said, hey, I noticed you didn't put any transitional fossils in there. And he said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is no such fossil for which one might make a watertight case. And there's another guy. He said... Uh, uh, instead of finding slow, smooth, progressive changes like they expected, they saw in the fossil record rapid bursts of change, new species appearing seemingly out of nowhere and then remaining unchanged for millions of years, hauntingly reminiscent of creation. Yeah, hauntingly. Yeah, they'll do whatever they can not to admit creation, and they'll keep sweeping it under the rug. But that rug is, I mean, there's so much, it's just oozing out. It's like whack-a-mole. It just keeps popping up. They can't pound it down fast enough. And... This guy, Dr. Carl Werner, he tried to prove evolution true. And it seems like everybody who tries to do that becomes a creationist, you know? And what he, what's, and that's a whole nother talk, and that evolution versus science, we go into that pretty deep, but on how that came about. The names that, that scientists give an animal, a scientific name, it's two words, Latin words, one for genus, one for species. All right. One's the species, yeah, that's the, that kind of animal, or that animal, and then another kind of animal. It's kind of like a horse and a donkey. They're different species, but they're the same genus, okay? And so if you were to look at that, do you think they're the same animal, the same species? No, okay. How about the same kind of animal, the same genus? Now, that's, they're both the same. They're both Canis familiaris. Anybody want to guess what that is? Anybody? Dog, yeah. That's right, they're both dogs. One's a bulldog, one's an Irish wolfhound. And they can produce fertile offspring. And so you can have that much variety within a species. And yet when they see something that's almost identical, they call them a different genus, different species. And he's got a whole book of this. And those are in the red, that's what the scientists call them. One's alive and one's a fossil. Different genus, again, they're identical. Different genus, different species. And he thought, well, maybe they're just having a bad day. You know, maybe this is an, ex an anomaly, but it's consistent. They always think that that's, uh, that's their fossil ancestor was a different genus and different species. And that's very important when you come to the coelacanth. The coelacanth is the index fossil for the dinosaurs. You find it in that layer of 65 million years, and then you don't find it again. So that's the index fossil. And what the problem was, they found it alive still today. And so... What the, what the textbooks will say is that the modern one came from the extinct one. And so then you look at it, oh, oh, that, uh, what, I can't pronounce them, that came from the other one, different genus, different species. No, they're the same animal, the same animal. All right, um, and we got little kids in here. Do you get nightmares? I had you, had, you had a nightmare? Do you, do you, <laughs> 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 He's going to be a preacher someday. <laughs>
<laughs> you think you okay? You might want to cover your eyes. This is my 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 favorite dinosaur or my favorite fossil. All right. You think you can handle it? All right. Fossil hat. <laughs> you scared? <laughs> it's from New Zealand. There was a mine. They locked it down. They opened it up. That thing had been there a few decades, and it turned into a stone. It does not take millions of years to form. It does not take millions of years for stalactites to form. Don't buy that for a second. You can make a fossil teddy bear. You put it under, a, they tie it to a string in this flow of water. Fossil teddy bear. Unless maybe the dinosaurs had them to go to bed. No, you don't think so? Oh, okay. You could have a market for that. All right. Okay, another round. This is Lucy. Look at Lucy. That, that's the big skeleton. Okay, Lucy's the big skeleton. Let's see what they have to say about Lucy. And these are the textbooks, again. The worst investment I ever made. Oh, this one. This one's high school. Okay, this high school one says that uh, it's a remarkably complete skeleton. Do you see that? It says remarkably complete. Okay, and this college textbook says that it's uh, nearly complete. We got 206 bones in our body. If it's nearly complete, remarkably complete, how many bones do you think we should have? Anybody take a guess? 100 and what? 180. Yeah, that's what I would think. The vast majority of them. We got 40. That's a lie. They're lying to our kids blatantly. That's a lie. 40 is not remarkably complete, you know, and it's not certainly not nearly complete. And yet they'll take these fragments, and this is what the St. Louis Zoo did, Oh, look at Lucy. Look at those human hands. Look at those human feet. Look at those whites in the eye. There's no evidence for any of that. And yet they want us to think that Lucy was our ancestor. And so you say, hey, you don't, what's your evidence for the feet and the hands? Oh, we found some of Lucy's cousins. And we know what those feet look like. Yeah, you're right. And they're more curved than a chimp's. Based on those bones, you could make either one. You can make a human. You can make another. And based on that, you can make whatever, you, whatever story you want to take, make. And the schools want us, and the museums want us to believe in ape-like ancestors. So they'll make us look like that. This is very interesting. In fact, this evolutionist says, evolution became, in a sense, a scientific religion. Almost all scientists have accepted it, and many are prepared to bend their observations to fit with it. You think they'll bend their observations? You think so? Uh, okay, all right. Okay, this is their documentary, PBS documentary, In Search of Human Origins. Let's just take a look at what they do. In Search of Human Origins. Fun. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bone seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. So what does Lucy's chimp hip look like? A chimp's, right? So why don't we conclude that Lucy's a chimp? Because you don't sell TV time or t-shirts finding monkey bones. The big money's in the human ancestors. And they've got to have something to prop up this evolutionary theory. You know, and they can't prop up a lie with truth. They've got to keep prop it up with lies, and that's what they do here. If I told you what they did to her hip, you won't believe me. So I'll just show you. show you. This is their documentary. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. <laughs> it was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Well, I hope so. <laughs> As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. Really? No kidding. Yeah, it better look a lot like ours after you do that. And I had a kiosk next to an anthropology major, and she didn't believe me when I told her this. And I said, I'll show you. No, I don't want to see it. Okay, they don't want their faith. And so, 
Yeah, that's what they're doing the evidence. Instead of changing the theory to fit the evidence, they change the evidence to fit the theory. So that one might be an easy one to score at home. And uh, judges, round 13, we're closing in. DNA, okay? DNA is so vastly complicated, so vastly complicated. There's no way that came about. That's what Francis Crick, he was the one who co-discovered it. And he didn't become a creationist. He became an alienist. He came from outer space. So he just made it, he didn't solve the problem. It just made it harder because now you got to throw space travel in. And so, yeah, we got good information going bad. You know, we're a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy going back to Adam and Eve. It's amazing. We work at all. But every generation has more mutations, more mutations. And, and so where did the good information come from? Evolutionists cannot explain that. And the mutation rate follows a 6,000 year model. Okay, and the laws of physics and chemistry does not allow for it to come into, to create life. Okay, now, if anybody want to be a millionaire out there? Yeah, all right. Okay, all you have to do is uh, prove how that genetic co code arose. <laughs> and that's been on the table 13 years. They took it off because nobody can do it. It's a dead-end experiment. But now they had, hey, you want to $10 million? Just prove how that information came about. Because they, they, with the Big Bang, you had, inf you had matter and energy. Hey, well, where's the information? They'll give you $10 million if you can figure it out. And the most, most profound unsolved problem in biology is life. Psst. Don't tell the creationists, but scientists don't have a clue how life came about. Not a clue. That's his panspermia quote. And this one, Edwin Cooklin, the probability of life originating from accident is comparable to a possibility of the unabridged dictionary res resulting from an explosion in a print shop. Ain't gonna happen. Did this church come together by an explosion? You know, and I'll ask the kids at college all the time, you know, you think that building got put together without a builder? No, no, no. Well, how in the world did your body get put together? I mean, your body's a gazillion times more complicated than that. Let's be intellectually consistent here. And this is uh, Fred Hoyle. The chance of higher life forms might have emerged this way is comparable to the chance of a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might um, uh, assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. It's not going to happen, folks. It's just not going to happen. And this is Francis Crick, his quote in this one book, Life Itself. The origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. Yeah. See, we got the miracle maker. They don't. It all makes sense scientifically with us. If we just change the definition of, of science to include God, everything fits, but they won't do it. And I'm just going to show you a brief clip of what's happening inside your cell. It's been called one of the wonders of the molecular world, an amazing nanoscale machine. ATP synthase is a high-tech micromolecular power generator inside the cells of your body. It generates adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, an energy molecule that provides fuel that every one of your cells needs to function. Without this fuel, your cells will cease operation, and so will you. And so will you. So how did we live before that evolved? You know, how did, uh, how did that happen? And so, well, uh, hey. um, but it's not gonna stop the college, the textbooks from making them believe you know, the origin of life on Earth. You know, Earth was too hot for life, and it goes through three paragraphs on how life couldn't have formed. And can you see that one right there? Some very scientific word. Somehow, despite the harsh environment, living organisms appeared about 3.8 billion years ago. Somehow. That's about as fuzzy as it gets. Cross out that whole section. Somehow is not a science term. Okay, they cannot explain life, and yet they won't allow God in the door. And they, this is it. Then a miracle occurred. They throw this at the creationists all the time. I throw it right back at them. You know, I think you should be a little more specific there in four, paragraph four. But they'll throw out this Miller-Urey ex experiment. It had the wrong starting material, the wrong process, and the wrong ending material. You know, but it still ended up, they, they say it's a spectacular success. You know, it made amino acids. Yeah, it made amino acids, but that's not life. That's like, hey, I found a lug nut. That means I have a car. No, it's got to be assembled for it to be a car. Somebody has to assemble those proteins. And they had, now proteins come in two, two ways. They're mirror images. Your hands are mirror images, okay? And then the proteins are like that. Sounds right-handed, one's left-handed. And in life, all the proteins are left-handed. 
And this, that experiment produced a 50-50 mix. And then when you die, it goes back to a 50-50 mix. There's something we don't understand about life. This one guy, he described death is when chemistry overcomes biology. Because there's a lot of chemistry that wants to destroy what's in your body. Okay, and then we go on to radiometric dating. Oh, the radiometric dating proves that the Earth is billions of years old. That's when you ask, uh, do you know what the unknowable assumptions are? You know, and it doesn't work. The unknowable assumptions are they don't know the initial condition of the rock. They don't know if, it, if the decay rate has been steady for billions or millions of years. And they don't know if it's been contaminated. Right? And what contaminates it? Water. It can wash elements in and out. That's why we don't have lead pipes. And when they do do the radiometric dating, you get, they get, it's always wrong. It's always wrong. <clears throat> you know, you got Mount St. Helens down on the bottom. It's, it should be like 40 years old. <laughs> they come up with 2.8 million. All right. See, when we know how old the age is, it doesn't work. And we're supposed to believe that it does work when we don't know the age. And then we find radio or carbon-14 in coal. We find it in diamonds. We find it in oil, all that stuff that's supposed to be millions of years old. But carbon dating does not last more than 50,000 years. Carbon does not last. So if you find any C-14, it proves that it's not millions of years old. Okay, so now, this is what we're all got here for. God's word is true. It's true in every area. But there's a lot of lies out there. And people are believing the lie. And, and I'll talk about it tonight. Tonight we got the dinosaur talk. I'll talk about a conversation I had. You know, the dinosaurs that almost shipwrecked her faith. And, and, and invite your friends, invite your neighbors, whatever. And just tell them if it's not the best dinosaur talk they've ever seen, tell them we'll give them your money back. How's that? Okay, and but mainly God's word is true, and man's word is a lie. That lie is causing a, you know, two out of three or nine out of ten kids to stop going to church, and we need to give them all the information so that they can make informed decisions. And uh, speaking of information, I put a couple of websites back on the table where I like to get all the information. You can uh, check those out, and it comes to the gospel. You know, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. You know, beware. Philosophy, you know, lover of knowledge. Vain deceit, that's empty lies. <laughs> that's evolution. And uh, tradition of men, rudiments of the world. The building block for this, you know, definitely socialism and communism, they teach evolution right away. Get rid of God. And our government schools are doing the same thing. If we don't get our rights from God, where do we get them from? You know, we're endowed by our creator, right? Certain unalienable rights among these life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. If there's no God, well, I guess we get our rights from the government. And isn't it interesting what kind of hoops they can make us jump through? You know, we have the right to worship. It's a God-given right. And there was, on one of those websites out there, thehighwire.com, there was a constitutional lawyer on there, a Jewish guy, and he said, the religion of public health is replacing our Constitution and Torah, is what he's saying. And so we just need to get all the information, make informed dis decisions. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and this is an interesting quote. We're going to wrap this up real quick. Um, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to understanding the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of the constructs. It's absurd to think a star comes from a dust cloud. It's absurd that life comes from pond scum. You know, it's just absurd. But why do they do it? They have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. And I gave a talk just down the road at a state college last year, I think. And it was so much fun. It's on my website. It's called uh, Think Outside the Box. Uh, materialism. No matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mis mystifying to the uninitiative, moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Does that sound scientific? Going where all the evidence leads? You know, if I had a, a chest of gold here, and I could give you unlimited time and unlimited resources to find this, but you had to stay in the building, and I hid it outside, would you ever find it? That's what they're doing in science. They're spending all this money trying to find the origin of life. Just think all the money pit that they've spent in looking for aliens. And they're doing that. They're looking, trying to find the origin of life. And they're looking in their materialistic box. You need a supernatural creator to make a natural creation. And they won't allow the divine foot in the door. 
And so that's the battle that we're at. So now if you're scoring at home, who won? Creation or evolution? <laughs> I was kind of biased in my presentation, but <laughs> but they're biased in theirs too. You know, Eugenie Scott was hammering, hammering Ken Ham. You believe, so you admit it then. You, you believe the Bible. Oh, yeah, I do. You're not willing to change anything about the Bible. Nope. Or about Genesis. Nope. And so, see, see that you're, you're, you're fixed. Your ideas are fixed. See, I'm a real scientist. You know, my, my ideas are open. I'll, I'll look at the data and do experiments and make, make the appropriate decisions, conclusions. And, and Ken Ham says, oh, let me ask you a question. You say you, you don't believe the Bible. That's you're an atheist. atheist. Is that right? She goes, yeah. And he goes, you don't believe the Bible. Is that right? She goes, no, I don't. How about the story of Genesis in, in the Bible? She goes, nope. And he goes, so tell me, are you prepared to change that? See, she's just as firm in his, her atheism as he is in his uh, biblical creation. And let the battle begin. Battle royale. Let the mind, let the inter information flow. You should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So we have to counter that evolution. You know, it's a house of cards if you know what questions to ask. So that's me at St. Cloud State. If you were to die today, where would you go? I asked that question to him probably three years ago. And boy, did that open an experience. And so we're helping them to get through Pensacola Christian. And if any of you guys have too much money in your accounts, you feel free to make an internal investment. Or if you want to, instead of going to Starbucks and spending money on yourself, how about you take that money and invest it in somebody who's going to have to go back to, and it's, a, it's, it's a, not a Christian country. We'll just say that. And so let's help them get equipped. I'm, look, I'm so much looking forward to heaven to see what God does with them. So much looking forward to that. Hear the battle stories. Are you guys going to have battle stories? You should be out there on Saturday. That's where the battle is, right? That's where the fun's at. And it's an eternal perspective. And it's scary at times, but the more you do it, the more fun it gets. And when you get somebody who understands the gospel and you take their fear of death away, it is like nothing else. Nothing else. All right. So how do we share the gospel? You know, if I've told you earthly things and you believe not, how should you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? That's what I tell the, the colleges and seminaries that preach theistic evolution. You believe Jesus, you know, if you don't believe what he says about the earth, how are you going to believe anything else? Okay, the wages of sin is death. Somebody's got to pay for our sin. It's not feeling sorry for your sins. It's not confession. It's not baptism. It's not penance. It's not doing rosaries or going to church. It's death. Somebody has to die for that sin. And you can spend, it's like, uh, we'll use... Uh, and we'll use this, okay, visually. You can do this on, this, on, this door, on the doorstep. Okay, this represents you and me in the world. This represents God. The problem is we got sin, right? God loves us and he hates our sin because this sin separates us from him. And he's a just God, so this sin has to be paid for. Somebody has to die for it. And I'll ask the college students, you know what he did 2,000 years ago so to pay, take care of this? And say, yeah, Jesus died on a cross. So when he came down, he lived a perfect life. And then when he was, he took our sin on him. And then when he was on the cross, that's when the love of God met the judgment of God. That sin had to be paid for. And Jesus said, I'll do it. And he went down and he laid down his life to pay for our sins. And he's paid for eternal life. And then he was buried and then he rose again, proving that he was God, validating everything he said. And he says, if you believe this, you have everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. And when I, and I ask students, this is a good witnessing question, do you think heaven's more like an earned reward or a free gift? And if they say earned reward, it's like, well, how, how important is the Bible in what you believe? Oh, it's real important. Then I'll show them this verse. The Bible says it's a gift. I'll show them Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. And I'll ask him, you know, if you were to die today, oh, I'm going to heaven. And I'll ask him, you know, if God says, why should I let you in? What do you tell him? And that tells me what they're putting their faith in. And if they're pointing to that, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, they're pointing at their works, not at what Jesus did on the cross. And it's very interesting because Jesus divides the whole world into two groups. He, those that believe and those who don't. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So which group are you in? Which group are you in? Have you accepted that free gift? Do you understand what Jesus has done for you? Are you still trying to work your way? All right, let's close in prayer.